Maybe you remember Mark Jackson as the head coach of an up-and-coming Warriors team, helping develop a young backcourt of Stephen Curry and Klay Thompson. Jackson knew from the beginning that they were going to be special, but his time as the coach didn't last as he was let go following the 2014 season. Or maybe you know Mark Jackson for his time as one-third of the broadcasting team, including himself, Jeff Van Gundy, and Mike Breen, a broadcasting career that has provided us with some wild statements, such as this statement about LeBron James' wife during the 2018 Finals. I'm shocked you downplayed Savannah. He said she was all city. James again from downtown! And I'd hit out the park, no question, with all due respect. But it seems like recency bias has made a lot of people forget about Mark Jackson, the player. Welcome back to Forgotten Player Profiles, and today we're going to look at a New York legend and 17-year NBA veteran. Jackson would even finish his career second all-time in career assist, and today sits at 6 on the all-time list. He was a starting point guard for some great teams throughout his career and contributed on both the offensive and defensive side of the ball. So why did a player with this type of resume play for seven different teams while never staying with the team for more than five consecutive seasons? Well, let's take a trip through his career and see if we can find out. So sit back, settle in, and let's see if we can jog your memory. Mark Jackson played high school ball at Bishop Laughlin Memorial where he would say in a 2011 interview that he was not highly recruited, that the reason he started getting attention was due to scouts coming to a game where Bishop Laughlin was playing a future NBA great and Dream Team alum Chris Mullen. Jackson was however known as an elite point guard in the playground basketball scene around the city. And even though Jackson chose a more organized route, streetball remained in the family, as his younger brother Troy Jackson made a name for himself during the N1 mixtape tour days. But you may know him better as Escalade. Jackson would accept a scholarship to play for the St. John's Redmen and would join former opponent Chris Mullen and future NBA player Bill Wennington to start the 1984 season. As a freshman, Jackson would play sixth man for a modest St. John's team, finishing with an 18-12 record and losing to Temple in the first round of the tournament. Jackson would finish the season with around 6 points, 2 boards, 3.5 assists, and .6 steals per game. He also shot nearly 58% from the field and was named to the Big East All-Rookie team. The 1985 season saw a lot of team success for St. John's. The team finished with a 31-4 record, led by Mullen, Wennington, and Walter Berry. The team made it all the way to the Final Four, where they would lose to number one seed and eventual champion Georgetown. Jackson remained in his six-man role, but saw a steep minutes decrease. Nonetheless, Jackson still finished with season totals of around five points, one rebound, three assists, and a steal per game. Mullen and Wennington would head to the NBA after this season making Mark Jackson the leader of the Redmen going into the 1986 season. Jackson would take a big step during the 1986 season, and as a starter, him and Barry led St. John's to a 31-5 record. Unfortunately, they could not repeat their tournament success and lost to Auburn in the second round. Jackson finished the season with around 11 points, 3.5 rebounds, 9 assists, and 2 steals per game. Jackson showed his ability on the offensive and defensive side of the ball and was rewarded with a first-team All-Big East selection, in addition, Jackson was the NCAA assist leader for the 1986 season. Jackson's senior season would be his finest, but St. John's would not have the same success. The team finished with the 21-9 record, and for the second straight season were eliminated in the second round, this time by DePaul. Although the Redmen had a poor showing, Jackson showed out, and finished the season with almost 19 points per game to go along with 3.5 rebounds, 6.5 assists, and 2 steals per game. Jackson would be rewarded with another first-team All-Big East selection, a second-team All-American selection, be a co-recipient of the Hagerty Award, which is an award given to the top player in the metropolitan area, and be awarded the Big East Defensive Player of the Year. Jackson had finished his four-year career at St. John's as the school leader in total assists with 728 and the only player in program history with more than 1,200 points and 600 assists. After a successful college career, Jackson's next step would be the NBA draft. Mark Jackson would be selected in the first round, 18th overall, of the 1987 NBA Draft by New York. It was a dream come true for Jackson, as he got to play for his hometown Knicks. The Knicks were looking to have a promising future ahead, as the team had third-year star Patrick Ewing to pair with the floor general Jackson. However, the Knicks' youth and experience were on display in the 88th season, as they finished with just a 38-44 record in a competitive Eastern Conference. The Knicks made the playoffs, but had no chance as they lost to the top-seeded Celtics, where Jackson would be effective in the series. Jackson thrived in Rick Pitino's fast-paced offense, and it was evident by his stellar rookie season, in which he finished with averages of around 13.5 points, 5 rebounds, 10.5 assists, and 2.5 steals. Jackson's performance would see him take home Rookie of the Year, 
and be named to the All-Rookie First Team. This would also be the only season of Jackson's career in which he averaged a double-double. The 1989 season saw the Knicks draft another New York point guard in the first round, as Rod Strickland was taken with the 19th pick. It seemed like a strange pick having just drafted a Rookie of the Year at the same position in Jackson, but Patino assured that it was meant to prolong Jackson's career by having a solid backup. The Knicks would also trade for future mainstay and enforcer Charles Oakley to pair with Ewing and Jackson. The Knicks saw market improvement as they finished the season 52-30. and 30. Jackson played great in the playoffs, averaging a double-double, as the Knicks swept Charles Barkley's Sixers in the first round. The second round saw Mark Jackson make a showboat play by sticking his tongue out at Michael Jordan before finishing a layup late in a Game 2 win. And we know Michael Jordan doesn't take kindly to disrespect. So Jordan would go on to average 40 plus points per game over the next four games, and the Knicks would lose to the Bulls in the series. Overall, it was an improvement and another successful season for Jackson that saw him voted to his first and only All-Star team, as he finished the year with averages of around 17 points, 4.5 rebounds, 8.5 assists, and 2 steals. 1990 saw the Knicks make some major changes, which didn't have a positive effect on Jackson. Due to disagreements with upper management, Patino left for the University of Kentucky and was replaced by Stu Jackson. This also meant that the fast-paced offense that Jackson thrived in was gone and the team would be operating of a half-court set from now on. Jackson had signed a five-year, $7.5 million contract prior to the start of the season, so he appeared to be locked in for the foreseeable future. Unfortunately, Jackson struggled to begin the year as he reported to training camp out of shape and was butting heads with Strickland over playing time, as Jackson felt that he had earned his starting spot and minutes. The Strickland-Jackson experience was very short-lived, as Strickland demanded a trade before making it through one full season with the Knicks. But Strickland got his wish, and he was traded to the Spurs for veteran guard Maurice Cheeks. Cheeks wasn't the player he once was, but he was humble, disciplined, and could run Stu Jackson's offense. Mark Jackson wasn't too thrilled about Cheeks' arrival, but Jackson's frustrations only got higher as Cheeks started over him to end the final 13 games of the season. The Knicks would finish 45-37 and and face the Celtics in the first round. Jackson would be a non-factor in the playoffs, getting only 9 minutes per game and even getting benched in their first round series versus Boston as Cheeks continued to start all 10 Knicks playoff games before the Knicks were eliminated by Detroit. Jackson would finish the season with averages of just under 10 points, around 4 rebounds, 7.5 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. A steep drop from his all-star year the previous season. By the 1991 season, Jackson had his third coach in four years, as John McLeod was hired to replace Stu Jackson early in the season. Jackson was now relegated to a backup role behind Cheeks, and would even be suspended for four games after an argument with McLeod and general manager Al Bianchi. Jackson was gaining a reputation as selfish and immature, and didn't appear to want to be in New York anymore. Overall, this was a disappointing season for the Knicks, as they finished 39-43 and and were swept by the Bulls in the first round, where Jackson would be even less of a factor than the year prior. Jackson ended the year averaging around 9 points, 2.5 rebounds, 6.5 assists, and a steal per game. Just want to take a quick pause. This is Mark Jackson's 1990-91 Hoops brand trading card. Now, Jackson was never a superstar, especially at this time during his career. So people would pull this card and think nothing of it. For years, it was only worth maybe at best 20 cents. However, there's something unique about this card. You see those two guys sitting courtside? Yeah, those two guys right there. Those are the Menendez brothers, and they were charged and convicted with pretty high profile crimes in the early 90s but we're not going to get into that if you want to learn more about that maybe look it up yourself just wanted to point that out because because of that this card's worth went up to 10 even 20 thousand percent again just because of this unique picture okay back to the video enter pat riley the former lakers coach was brought in prior to the 92 season to be the knicks coach Cheeks was also traded in the offseason, which opened the door for Jackson to reclaim his starting spot. As a starter, Jackson helped the Knicks finish 51 and 31 and make it out of the first round of the playoffs before once again losing to the Bulls in round two. Jackson would, however, be a solid playoff contributor for the first time in years. 
Jackson produced his highest regular season point and assist total since year two, as he finished with averages of around 11 points, four rebounds, and eight and a half assists per game, and he also threw in one and a half steals. During the 1992 offseason, Jackson was given a change of scenery, as he was traded to the LA Clippers. Riley would make the trade for the defense and smart play of Doc Rivers and Charles Smith. Jackson would team with Danny Manning and Ron Harper in the 1993 season to help the Clippers reach the playoffs with a 41-41 record, where they pushed the Houston Rockets to five games. This team seemed like they had potential, but it would prove to be short-lived when Danny Manning made it clear that he did not want to play for head coach Larry Brown. Jackson would have his best season since his All-Star selection, as he averaged around 14.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, 9 assists, and 1.5 and steals. 1994 saw a train wreck of a season for the Clippers, as they went 27-55. and 55. This would be the worst season of Jackson's career up to that point, and his first time missing the playoffs. Danny Manning would be traded mid-season for Dominique Wilkins, in a confusing trade from the Hawks' perspective, as they were first place in the East at the time of the trade. Jackson and the Clippers just couldn't put it together this season, likely due to their best player being disgruntled up until his trade, and then it being too late in the season to recover once Wilkins was acquired. Nonetheless, Jackson finished with season averages of around 11 points, 4.5 rebounds, 8.5 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. Prior to the 1995 season, Jackson was traded to the Indiana Pacers, where he would be reunited with Larry Brown, his coach during his first year in LA. Jackson would see his most success during his time with the Pacers. In his first season, Jackson teamed with established players such as Reggie Miller, Rick Smiths, and the Davis brothers. The Pacers would go 52-30 and, and make the playoffs, where they would make quick work of the Atlanta Hawks in a first round sweep. The second round would be the matchup Jackson was waiting for, as the Pacers took on the Knicks. This series is famously known for Reggie Miller's incredible 8 points in 9 seconds, in which he took a pass from Jackson to hit 1-3, then stole the Knicks inbound pass, retreated to the 3 point line, and hit another 3. Then he drained the go-ahead free throws with 7.5 seconds left to give the Pacers the win. The Pacers would defeat the Knicks in 7, before losing to the Magic in 7 in the Eastern Conference Finals. For the season, Jackson would average around 7.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, 7.5 assists, and 1.5 steals per game. The 1996 season saw the Pacers finish 52-30 and again. However, this season the Hawks got revenge in the playoffs, as they knocked the Pacers out in the first round partially due to the fact that Reggie Miller did not play in the first four games with an eye injury. Unfortunately, Jackson was outplayed by Atlanta's Mookie Blaylock in the first round loss. Overall, it was another successful season for Jackson, as he finished with averages of around 10 points, 4 rebounds, 8 assists, and a steal per game. Jackson seemed to have matured, but also had found a team that accepted him and appeared that they had a bright future together. Oh, well maybe not. Prior to the 97 season, Jackson and Ricky Pierce were traded to the Denver Nuggets for Jalen Rose and Reggie Williams, in a move that was looked at as a major overhaul for the Nuggets, as they had also just lost franchise cornerstone to Kembe Mutombo to the Atlanta Hawks. Mark Jackson was seen as expendable with the development of rookie Travis Best the year prior. Pacers president Donnie Walsh gave reason for the trade being to improve draft capital as picks were also exchanged and to get younger. This would be Jackson's fourth team of his career so far. Jackson was great for Denver as he averaged 10.4 points and 12.3 assists in 52 games for the Nuggets. The Nuggets were bad, but maybe Jackson could be a leader on the team. And what is going on? At the 97 trade deadline, the Pacers reacquired Jackson as Travis Best was not producing at the rate that they were hoping for. In speaking about the trade, Walsh would say, this trade can help return the kind of feeling that we want on our basketball team, Walsh said. We were losing confidence as a club, and we needed something to help us get back on track. So it was clear that Jackson may have left his selfish attitude that was present during his Nick days in the past, or at least the Pacers didn't think it was an issue. Jackson obviously slotted back in with the Pacers pretty easily to the tune of 9 points and almost 10 assists per game. However, the Pacers went 14-15 and 15 with Jackson back in the lineup, and would finish 39-43 and 43 and miss the playoffs. Jackson had a memorable season though, as he led the league in assists with overall averages of about 10 points, 5 rebounds, 11.5 assists, and 1 steal per game. The 1998 season began a 3 year stretch where the Pacers had their most success in franchise history. Indiana would also acquire Jackson's former St. John's teammate,
Chris Mullen prior to the start of the season. The Pacers would tear through the regular season, en route to a 58-24 record, good for second in the East. Jackson, the defensive-minded Pacers, would easily get through the Cavs in the first round and the Knicks in the second round. Jeez, Jackson really had their number in the playoffs. Sadly, Jackson the Pacers ran into the impenetrable force that was Michael Jordan and the Bulls in the Eastern Conference Finals. Reggie Miller would hit another famous clutch shot when he won Game 4 with a three-pointer. The Pacers fought, but ended up losing to the Bulls in 7. Jackson averaged about 8.5 points, 3 rebounds, 8.5 assists, and a steal per game, but it did seem like the Pacers had really put it together. 1999 saw the retirement of Michael Jordan. And fresh off a conference finals loss to Jordan, the Pacers must have felt like this was their opportunity. In the lockout shortened season, Indiana finished with a 31-17 record and a second seed in the East. The Pacers tore through the first two rounds, sweeping both the Bucks and the Sixers en route to another matchup with the eight-seeded Knicks, this time in the conference finals, in a playoffs that saw Mark Jackson really step up his game. But the Knicks came to play and ended up beating the Pacers in six games. This series was highlighted by a Larry Johnson four-point play in the closing seconds of Game 3 to give the Knicks a win. Johnson would finish the season with about 7.5 points, 4 rebounds, 8 assists, and 1 steal per game. Coming off a successful yet disappointing season, 2000 saw the Pacers break through and make it to their first ever NBA Finals. The Pacers were an aging team, and it was clear that this would probably be their last run. They pushed through the regular season with a 56-26 record, and Jalen Rose became one of their best players, en route to winning Most Improved Player. In a complete repeat of the playoffs, the Pacers would beat the Bucks, then the Sixers, and finally meet the Knicks in the Conference Finals. This time, however, the Pacers prevailed and moved on to the NBA Finals. This was the first Finals for longtime NBA veterans such as Jackson, Miller, Rick Smiths, and Chris Mullen, and they put up a respectable effort, but their aging team was no match for Shaq and Kobe, as the Lakers won in six games. Jackson averaged around 8 points, 4 rebounds, 8 assists, and 1 steal per game for the season. One thing I forgot to mention was that Mark Jackson had to make an adjustment to his game before the 2000 season, as the league implemented a new 5 second rule, which made it so that players were only permitted to back down their defender in the post for 5 seconds or less. If done for longer, it would result in a loss of possession. This rule became known as the Mark Jackson rule because of how much of a dependence he had on backing his defenders down in the post for long periods of the shot clock. In the 2000 offseason, it appeared Mark Jackson wanted to stay with the Pacers, but those sentiments may not have been felt on both sides. Jackson would accept a $16 million deal with the Raptors, citing their shown interest and respect, as well as playoff chances, as his reason to sign. While Jackson did say that Indiana offered him a deal, he felt disrespected by said deal, and he believed both sides knew it wasn't a fair deal when it was offered. Additionally, the Raptors pursued Jackson after former teammate Antonio Davis lobbied for his acquisition. Jackson would see himself move past Isaiah Thomas for fourth all-time on the assist list in a game against Golden State, but he wouldn't see himself finish the season in a Raptors uniform, as he was traded back to where it all began at the trade deadline when the Knicks acquired him from the Raptors. Jackson would help the Knicks finish 48-34, where they would coincidentally face and lose to the Raptors in the first round. Jackson finished the season with averages of about 7.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, 8 assists, and 1 steal per game. Jackson was also able to play in 83 games due to the trade. Jackson would remain the Knicks starter for the 0-2 season, but the Knicks would take a step back and finish 30-52 and, and miss the playoffs. The fact that starting center Marcus Camby was out for the majority of the season didn't help the Knicks' playoff chances either. Jackson would continue his consistent play and finish with averages of around 8.5 points, 4 rebounds, 7.5 assists, and a steal per game. At the end of the year, Jackson was traded to the Nuggets, but he refused to play for a rebuilding team at this stage in his career and was immediately waived. About a month before the 2003 season, Jackson signed with the Utah Jazz and became a backup to John Stockton, his first time being a backup since his Nick days. This season had ups and downs for Jackson as he moved past Magic Johnson for second all-time on the career assist list behind only his teammate, John Stockton. However, Jackson gave flashbacks of his attitude problems with the Knicks way back at the start of his career, when multiple reports came out then and at later dates that Jackson was dividing the locker room in trying to convince players that he should be starting over Stockton. It appeared that Jackson was able to get some of the younger and newer players on his side by selling a different play style that he was more suited for. 
while the Jazz veterans sided with their longtime floor general. And one of these veterans, Greg Ostertag, would seemingly confirm at least some truth to this in an 08 interview, where he admitted that Jackson would stir the pot. Although this was reportedly mediated, the rift it caused likely permanently affected team chemistry. And even though the Jazz made the playoffs, they lost to the Kings in five games. Even though it was a messy season, Jackson played in all 82 games but saw the lowest totals of his career as he averaged around 4.5 points, 2 rebounds, 4.5 assists, and half a steal per game. Jackson would round out his career playing the second half of the 04 season as a Houston Rocket, where he backed up Steve Francis for a 45-37 Rockets team that lost to the Lakers in the first round. Jackson's contributions went way down as he averaged around 2.5 points, 1.5 rebounds, 3 assists, and half a steal per game. And this would be the end of Jackson's career. Jackson didn't reach his legendary assist totals and have as long of a career as he did from huge gaudy stat lines, but instead from consistent play for over 15 years. As a player, he was an elite passer and floor general, and when given the opportunity, could always lead and have others follow him wherever he went, even though he probably should have avoided doing that in Utah. Jackson was a guy that could run your offense, keep everyone on the floor around him happy, and had the defensive ability to make him an easy lineup insertion on both ends of the floor. He was lucky enough to experience a lot of success and go to the playoffs with every team he played on. I still think recency bias has clouded our memory for Mark Jackson, the player. He may not be the most exciting player to watch, but if you appreciate floor vision and crisp passes, he's one of the most entertaining. His biggest downfall seemed to be an overinflated ego, or maybe more of a sense of entitlement. But this also comes from an unwavering confidence which he possessed that always made him feel that he was the best option at point guard for whatever team he was on. He felt he knew what was best and when things were going right, he was usually pretty quiet. But if things weren't going how he wanted, then you heard from him. But if that's the case, when he was quiet and things were going like he felt they should, his teams won. So maybe he knew what he was doing. And hey, Maybe this was foreshadowing for his coaching ability that would be on display from 2011 to 2014, where the Warriors would make consecutive playoff appearances and get their first 50-plus win season in 20 years with Jackson at the helm. Okay, that's enough about Mark Jackson. Time to wrap this one up. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Forgotten Player Profiles, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, leave a comment, or even subscribe, so you know whenever an episode is being uploaded. See you next time.